Okay, so thank you all for joining me here today to talk about how we survive the future. And uh, this is me, I'm your host, uh, Philip Mays, the Managing Director and CEO of Mighty Kingdom. And we've survived quite a lot over the last 10 or 11 years. And so hopefully some of those lessons uh, we can, I can share with you today and can help us navigate this new exciting world that we live in. Uh, and I like to start these things off every year by just sort of going through what has happened over the last year. And, and really, it's been a lot. This has been a particularly uh, incredibly challenging year for so many people. We're still in the midst of a, of a global pandemic. And this has affected all of us in so many ways uh, and still does to this day. Uh, you know, the No international travel being from New Zealand means that it's I haven't seen my family in person for you know almost two years, maybe longer. Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of other people out there in a similar boat. And but alongside those challenges, I guess it has brought some opportunities. We've seen some game companies have a lot of success within this time, uh, as a lot of people are at home playing video games. And it's kind of forced our government here in Australia to think a little bit differently. And you know, as they sort of chart their their course out of this pandemic and, and look at ways that they can find growth within the economy, um, they've sort of looked at ideas that perhaps they hadn't looked at in the past. And that has led to uh, the arrival of federal support. We have a PDV-esque rebate uh, due to appear imminently. It's not here yet, uh, it does kick in next year. And yes, there is a, a minimum spend uh, to get there to unlock that, uh, that potential. But this is a significant win. It's a massive shift for our industry and, and really does send a signal about what uh, the government believes can be a, a significant part of the new economy. And you know, I just want to give out a, a massive uh, thank you and and uh, and send a lot of love out to to Ron and the team at IGEA, and to everyone else who worked tirelessly in the background to make this happen. It's it's been a, a long road for a lot of people, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's a fantastic result. Also, an interesting timing as well because it coincides with a couple of trends that I've been uh, following overseas. Uh, the first being that everybody is looking for content. Like literally, everyone wants content. There are at least six major subscription services for games uh, looking to become the Netflix of games, including Netflix, who will uh, obviously love to be the Netflix of games. What do these com what do these uh, services need? They all need content, and and um, they're out there. There are deals to be made at the moment. If you've got the right product on the right platform, there's a, a lot of opportunity within our within our industry, and uh, it's actually getting harder and harder for them to find that content because the industry is consolidating in a big way. We've seen this trend uh, internationally it's been happening for a while embracer have been out at the forefront of that but it really did accelerate under COVID. we're seeing far more um, companies being acquired left front center and while this has traditionally been the purview of internationals we, we're starting to see that uh, that trend reach our shores and you know as i was putting this together i was looking just across 2021 and seeing the significant changes that we've been through um, started off in in January with uh, 505 acquiring Infinity Plus 2. Uh, and then just barely a week later, Nacon was the big, uh, big spend to, to get big ant. Um, fantastic result for, for Ross and the team there. Um, couldn't happen to, to nicer people. Uh, but then, you know, just in March, we saw keywords require a majority stake in, in Tantalus and, and really uh, make, a, make a, a claim for uh, a stake of the Australian pie. And again, barely a week later, MTG uh, with a, a humongous acquisition of Ninja Kiwi, our friends across the ditch over in New Zealand um, with a fantastic, fantastic result. And just more recently, we've seen Animoca acquiring Blowfish. Um, and again, just a fantastic number um, that they've managed to pull out and, and, and a great result for the team over there. And if we're be honest with ourselves, we should expect more of this. It's, 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 it's a good sign. It's a sign of a healthy industry, of um, a healthy ecosystem where uh, larger businesses are looking at the, the opportunities and, and what people are doing here in Australia and, and seeing uh, the, the potential of, of, of what we have. But in addition to the acquisitions, we have now got two listed companies and that's exciting for us. We joined Playside on the ASX uh, earlier this year. Um, and uh, while that whole journey is, is a topic probably for, a, for another day, it does it shows once again that you know there are there is investment looking at our industry and that there are many different paths available to companies today. Um, from going from zero to two in such a short pace of time just shows that uh, it's not all about uh, um, you know staying small or getting big as we'll touch on a bit later uh, that there are other avenues to, to success as well so if you total all that up together 
you have over four hundred million dollars invested in the last year through acquisitions and IPOs and and, and whatnot. That's a that's a significant number. And admittedly, Ninjakiri accounts for a fair ch- chunk of that change, uh, which is a you know a staggering number for for them. But uh, that's some um, that's still a significant amount of money anyway you cut it. And uh, that just shows the interest that there is in our region. Um, another way you can track the interest here is to look at the international publisher presence and, and fueled by those acquisitions we're starting to see a lot more names turn up on the register we've had uh, i think when i put this slide together last year there were four companies on the on the list now there's twice as many we have um the, the people who are here are not just uh, you know not just new entrants appearing but the the ones who are here are expanding their presence as well um and again, this is a great thing. We want to make sure that our industry has companies of all scales, all sizes, and all different uh, different parts of the industry represented here. Um, but you know, having international companies here is a great thing, but it can't be the only thing that we have in our industry. So, a good question to ask ourselves at all stages is you know, how are the locals doing? You know, and in that front, we're we're doing okay. Uh, you're looking here at uh, the five largest studios um, just by headcount, and you'll see uh, ourselves, Mighty Kingdom, and Playside. They're uh, holding down the fort for the locals uh, alongside some of the, the larger internationals there. Uh, when I put this list together two years ago, there were no local studios with over 100 staff. And now there are two. So that's really exciting. And hopefully we can get some more people uh, and more companies joining us uh, at, that, at that milestone. Uh, you know, the question we always, again, have to ask is how, how long can this hold? How long is this going to last? I'm sure if, uh, if Playside and I, I know if we have our way that that's going to be the way for a long period of time and uh, long may it last. So I look across the industry and I think this is a moment of, of great opportunity. If I had to pick one word to describe the industry, that's what it would be. There's like a, a, an immense amount of momentum building. It's it's a fantastic uh, place to be at the moment. And I feel like the rest of the world is just starting to wake up to the opportunities that are available here, to the potential, to the talent uh, and, and to the skills that we have. And there is a significant opportunity because, you know, when you look at our industry here in Australia and compare it to the world, we are anomalous in, in a number of ways. And I know in the past, I like to point out how much revenue growth we've, we have to um, we have to go through to, to catch up with our peers. But this time I wanted to take a slightly different tack uh, and I look at how we compare uh, on a population on a per capita basis. So essentially looking at how many people are employed within the game industry in different countries per 100,000 head of population. So no surprises here, Canada is a bit of an outlier. Uh, it's had the, the some of the best support systems. They've been there for the longest. Uh, they have that full robust ecosystem of companies at scale and, uh, and the smaller startups. So it's not surprising to see them out in the front there. Um, Sweden uh, and USA, two other powerhouses in the gaming space, um, very vastly different ends of the population spectrum. They're just showing sort of how uh, the industry is represented in these different markets. Uh, Finland is one that we talk to a lot. Again, a, a place that has had fantastic end-to-end um, support for businesses in the technology space, of which games um, often falls into. So that's um, you know another good parallel to to draw. The UK is an interesting one here. They have uh, recently put in some more aggressive and more more um, uh, some some rebates that have have really shifted the dial for them. So this number is is is, is likely to grow again and again uh, in the coming years. Uh, Germany. Uh, again, just very recently put in some incentives for our industry, so we should see this number pick up. So how about locally here across the ditch in New Zealand? Oh, just a, a wee little number. Um, New Zealand doesn't have any coordinated uh, funding or dedicated funding for our industry. Uh, so I think that this again shows that there's some potential there, but you may have noticed that I've left Australia for last and hopefully um, you know, you've had some guesses about where we, we would land. And uh, so let's have a look. Wow. There we go. Not even tall enough to show a number. The, the number there is five. So five people working in our game industry for every 100,000 uh, head of population. That's uh, not even tall enough to fit the number. And the average, if we add the trend line, it should be around 60 just to show that there's some significant headway, uh, uh, some significant distance that we need to travel to, to get there. But if, if we did get there, if we did manage to lift this bar all the way up to that average line, uh, so that's not being the number one performer, but not being the worst performer, being somewhere in the middle. That's 14,000 new jobs. E- even just to get to where New Zealand's at would mean tripling the size of our industry as it currently is. And if we think about where the UK is and where Germany are at, 
that's that's somewhere between eight and ten thousand new jobs. These are significant numbers, and this is why I see tremendous opportunity here because we should be much further ahead. We should have more people working in this industry. Uh, and if you look around all the training institutions and you look around all the um, universities, there are many, many people who want to work in this industry, and uh, there hasn't traditionally been a lot of opportunity for them. But that's changing, right? With these with these new publishers coming, with new companies starting. We're about to enter a, a period of, of rapid growth. And I can imagine that if you are working in the industry at the moment as, as an employee of the company, this is probably what the industry looks like for you, right? It's it's Christmas. All your Christmases have come at once. And, and there you are, uh, super excited about all the opportunity there. Uh, there's just a massive uh, amount of op opportunity in front of you. There's an increasing number of options of what you can do and what you can achieve and what kind of companies you can work for. Uh, the danger here, I guess, is that um, it may become overwhelming. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to encourage anyone who's who's looking at having a career in the video games industry to make sure you, you take control of your career. Have, have a vision about where you want to go. Don't just bounce from uh, job A to job B and, and just, uh, you know, when the recruiters come calling, when the headhunters come calling, have a goal about what you would like your career to look like when you look back. Um, one thing to consider, and if you think about it this way, if AAA is the, is the place you want to be, just be aware that those games take a long time to make. It takes three to five years to, to, to build a game uh, of that, you know, in, in that scale and that magnitude. So really, if you're looking across an entire career, you may only, may only make you know, 10, or, 10 or 12 games if you're lucky across your entire career. So be, be picky, you know, sort of construct your, construct your portfolio. Um, you know, the, the, this is like the, the Tarantino approach. Uh, what does that what does it say about you? What did you want to contribute to the to the discourse? What do you want to contribute to the industry? Um, and use that to drive you just as much as um, obviously make sure you get paid appropriately, but uh, make sure that you're not just um, you're doing it for the right reasons and that you're you're being an active participant in your own career. So for those of us who uh, are employees but perhaps own our own businesses or or uh, own our own studios or, or run a partnerships. I mean, what are the rest of us? What do we do? And I think that uh, this is this is the the crux of the presentation today. You know, for businesses of of any size, um, I do like to say to you, you know, make sure you have a, a a vision and a purpose for you for your business, but have a have a, a goal in mind of what where do you want to be in, in in three, five, ten years time. Have a vision of that of that future. What does the industry look like? What is your place within it? Um, you know, there, are, there are so many opportunities around. There, there are so many exciting things that you could do. Uh, how do you pick the ones? You know, how do you how do you make sure you're picking the right um, right opportunities for your business? Uh, and again, it can feel overwhelming. So um, sometimes it's good to think in broad strokes and have some strategies that you can um, employ to help deal with the, with the with the rapidly changing nature of our industry. Um, and so I'll, I'll run through a few of them to, today and see if you can pick. You can pick where Mighty Kingdom lands on this on the spectrum. So the the first strategy is uh, go big. And you know, here I'm going to put some sort of numbers around things. I'd say for us at the moment, being going big is going past 100 people, like getting getting to a significant size. Uh, and so if you want to use scale as your as your strategy for survival, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're is you're beating the beating the big guys at their own games. You're increasing the scale of your projects over time to, to reach that AAA scale. Uh, and so essentially you're removing those, um, uh, the difference between yourself and other studios so that it can help you keep staff around who um, would otherwise go and look for AAA opportunities elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the, the way to get there is, to, is to, to use investment. It's going to be difficult to grow just through revenue alone. So quite often you'll um, take on investment to allow you to grow ahead of your revenue. Uh, it does require a lot of confidence in your in your modeling and your forecasting and making sure that there are, is revenue and, on the horizon and it, and it will arrive. Um, so just make sure you, you get all your, all your ducks in a row there. And you know, one of the things I will say about investment is is choose your investors wisely. They are going to be as involved in your business as, as you are. And you want to make sure that they're, it's like a marriage, right? You want to make sure it's someone that you're going to want to spend a lot of time with, that you're going to have good, uh, robust discussions that they're going to add value to your business and not just uh, look push you towards uh, outcomes that you that you may not want. Make sure there's alignment there. Um, one of the other benefits of, of scaling up is that you get to maximize the access to to government support. They, there are a lot of uh, some, you know programs and systems in place, but they can be a bit difficult to understand as a smaller studio and, and actually 
dedicate the time to be able to uh, to put in applications. And one of the benefits of, of, of growth and, and scale is that you can have people who are dedicated to to just doing that. There's a lot of um, complexity about how you need to construct your applications for things such as R and D and um, the, the upcoming rebate or if your state um, state rebates. You want to make sure that you're being as effective as you can uh, to maximize that return on investment. So when you're putting a dollar into your business, you're getting as much out of it as you can. Um, and scaling up allows you to uh, to dedicate resource to ensuring that you get uh, the best bang for your buck when it comes to um, comes to that support. Also means you can get a lot more confidence in the accuracy and and the robustness of those numbers, and it reduces that risk of any any clawbacks or any uh, um, you know of, of any other sort of issues arising from a from a uh, a rushed uh, a, a, a rushed uh, you know application. So um you know another way that you can achieve this uh, from scaling up is not just through investment and and and, and through uh, hiring of talent, you can do it through acquisition as well, or through mergers. And, and we're starting to see some smaller companies around Australia uh, come together to uh, you know, build something bigger with the two of them combined. It's, it's, it's a strength in numbers, right? It's like the the Captain Planet strategy. With the powers combined, uh, you can do far more than you can if you if you stay apart. Um, and there are synergies there that mean that you can start to access some of these benefits of scale. Um, it would be remiss of me not to mention IPO. That's a, a path that we've been on. And uh, so you can probably tell that scale is, is definitely uh, you know, one of our strategies here at Mighty Kingdom. The, uh, it's a fantastic outcome. It gives you access to, to capital markets and, and to give you the opportunity. If you've proven your model and you know that your model works uh, and, and the market is recognizing that, then there's an opportunity to um, and access even further capital to scale up even more. So it's a, it's a great way to do it. And it gives your, your early investors an opportunity to, um, to exit as well. The, um, the only sort of gotcha here I'll put here is that if you do want to have scale and growth as your strategy, it, it is a bit of a go big or go home um, situation. Once you're on this path, it's difficult to stop. Um, and in fact, uh, once you've taken investment on and once you've, once you've uh, sort of made a statement about what your business is going to be. It's almost impossible to take a step back because that's uh, you know that's a, a failure of the model and a failure of the business. So just be aware that once you do, once you do go big, once you make that decision, that it's a it's a bit of a train that's on the tracks that's going to keep running for a long period of time. So you're going to be doing this for for a long time yet. Um, but yeah, there's a there are benefits that, that come with that scale, but uh, just make sure you're aware of the of the cost as well. So opposite of going big is to go small. Uh, and in this case, I'm thinking of a, of a team that's sort of less than five um, people, you know, mostly um, uh, working in a partnership or working on a small project. Uh, and, you know, I call this uh, the, the side hustle um, uh, piece of advice, and which is don't give up your day job. Um, essentially, you know, making games is expensive. You need to, to pay for people and you need, and you need to, to pay for tools. And uh, just just jumping into it straight straight away cannot be the it's not always the best um, the best approach. So uh, a good strategy when you're staying small is to have a job elsewhere that can pay the bills uh, and doesn't demand so much of your time that you can't dedicate uh, attention to building your product and building your game alongside it. The um, another benefit of being small is you can have everybody equally invested in the project. And you often see this in, in small teams is that they're all equal shareholders of, of the business or of the idea. Uh, and that means that any successes are shared, um, but the but the costs are shared as well. It, it means that it's 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 much harder for someone to want to leave something that they're a part of and, and go somewhere else. So you, you tend to find people will stick around and and see it through to the end and see it through to its conclusion. Um, particularly if if it's uh, you know, you're not relying on it for your sole source of income. So I think that's a that's a good one. And you know that's um it's one of those things that does become difficult as you grow. I, I should have mentioned that earlier is that uh, getting everyone involved and aligned gets uh, harder and more challenging as your company grows. And so staying small means you can keep that, um, keep that, uh, keep everyone's in, aligned, uh, keep, keep that alignment across the entire organization. And uh, one thing I would say, if you're going to stay small is to uh, stay self-funded, you know, with, with the, in a small company, it may not make sense to take investment on because it can be a distraction. It, it requires all the overhead. And when you've only got a, a small number of people, um, any time out of the business and, and not working on it is is, is, a, is a detriment. Um, so I'm, I'm, that would be my recommendation here. And and as you uh, find success, make sure you're, you're, you're scaling your time to match it. So 
as your product comes to market, as you start to find users, as you start to find players and you start to generate revenue, that's when you can start to dial down your other commitments. And once you can see that there are some success for you to back um, so that you're not over committing early, you're not putting, you're not bidding the house on, on an idea that you've got to make sure that all your, uh, you know, all the essentials are, are squared away. The, um, the one thing I would, I would say though, is that when you stay small, it, it can mean that the returns can be small. When you're a small team, your products are necessarily a bit more limited in scope. Um, they can be, uh, you know, a small small team, small product, small price point, uh, small small player base. Uh, it just means that your uh, returns can be a bit smaller than if you if you run at scale. That's not always the case. So I mean, there's uh, the team cherry principle. There's uh, you know three or four of them who've, who've had significant success and, and show that it can happen um, for teams of, of all scales. Um, but it does mean that sometimes when you're small, it just takes a bit longer to get to market as well um, because you've got. Uh, uh, you know, fewer people um, pouring their, their energy and attention into it. So just something to be aware of if you, if you go down this path that um, you'll see, you know, there'll be a lot of noise around you of, of people who are, who are seem further ahead or, or seem, um, you know, to be, to be getting success sooner. Uh, but don't, don't be sucked in. Just, just understand that it will take a little bit longer to, to get there. So next strategy I'd like to talk about is uh, focused. Uh, and this particular strategy is around um, really looking at a particular part of the industry uh, and and honing in on it as your one area of expertise. And uh, this this could be a, a piece of IP, a piece of technology, a piece of um, something that you've developed, uh, or it could just be your you know your design skill, your art skills, or animation. There's a whole whole bunch of ways you could you could do it. But essentially, what you're doing is you're focusing on becoming the best in a particular area of the industry. And then rather than trying to compete with the large companies, you're working alongside them. You know we we know and we've seen in, in many places that when the publishers start to appear and the larger studios appear within a within an area. And one of the first things they do is they look around for other companies to work alongside because they will take their time to grow and they would rather work with established players and get started quickly. So this is a, a great way to, to build relationships with partners that may end up becoming um, natural acquirers if that's, if that's your journey or just become like long-term relationships that you can build with, with some of these large studios. Uh, and you know, if, if services, are, um, you know, if, if that sort of bespoke service isn't your thing, there's a, an opportunity as well to create uh, SaaS-like products. And, and the, the SaaS model is one that is very well known within the investment community. And, uh, you know, you can look at the success of Canva and others about looking at how you can create um, a software solution that people can pick up uh, and, and use. And, and uh, they're often driven by subscription. And, and they can be great because, uh, you know, as you grow that subscriber base, um, the revenue just comes in month on month and, and that can be a, a great way of growing a successful business within within this industry. And so, you know, as with anything, there's, there's always the, the, the caveats and you want to make sure if you go down the path of um, creating a like a, a, an IP play that you're protecting yourself. And one of the hidden costs here in this space is the, the cost of protection. So there's the cost of acquiring um, you know, things like patents and, and, and whatnot and and making sure you've got uh, you know, the, the correct licenses in place so that people can't take your technology. Um, so it just means that your legal costs are quite a bit higher and particularly in the technology space, as you think about protection, how do you actually stop someone from stealing your idea? How do you, how do you go out and, and defend it? That, that can be a significant cost as well. So just something to be aware of, get used to talking to lawyers. So the last one, uh, the last strategy here, or maybe the second last strategy is to get weird and this is really the in-between strategy between being small and getting big. This is about um, being different, like not necessarily trying to mimic what the big guys are doing. Uh, and, you know, how do you get weird to survive? So you have an opportunity as, a, as a, what I'd call a mid-tier studio to explore opportunities that larger studios would avoid. And uh, I know, you know, I'm calling me a skeptic of it, but NFTs are a great example of, of uh, you know, this, this strategy at play. You're seeing some companies have some significant successes, but they're not the established players. They're not your, um, you know, your EAs and your Activisions and whatnot. They're um, they're new companies. They're emerging companies. So that's just an example of how a, a smaller company can take advantage of an opportunity in a way that a big corporate can't. Uh, there's uh, you know plenty of things other than NFTs out there as well. There are you know, emerging platforms, emerging markets, uh, new audiences. Uh, and even new talent, right? Like if you can find the right person with the right idea and and, and give them an opportunity to to bring that um, bring that out, then you might be able to capture onto a trend before anyone else even knows that it exists. 
So this is you know, definitely uh, take advantage of your scale there. Like w w one of the things someone pointed out to me once was that uh, you know to shift the dial for a company like Tencent, um, your your numbers need to be in the billions, right? They they make such significant revenue that that's where they're looking at that really deep end of the pool. Um, whereas I'm sure for a, for a bunch of us, uh, you know, hundred million dollars, it's not a billion, but it's, it sure sounds pretty good. Uh, and and that's that's sort of the space that you're playing in here, right? You're looking at opportunities that are just just below that scale that shifts the dial for the big boys. The uh, other thing you can do as a, as, as a mid-tier studio is is um, you know, when you when you hear about all the perks that are offered at some of these um, uh, some of these companies, they um, you, know, you can kind of get this uh, this, this idea that there's a bit of a, um, an arms race there to try and catch up with. But oftentimes um, there are things that you can offer in a, as a small studio that just don't make sense as a, as the company scales up. So so lean into those, right? Like um, you can you can work in more quirky places. Uh, you can have a more interesting office. Uh, you can you can allow dogs in, uh, and and you can you know there's, there's a whole bunch of things. It's a lot harder to take a whole team out to the movies when there's 500 of you. you know, it's something that you can still do when there's uh, 20 or 30. So yeah, you know, there, there's things that I think are, are fantastic and that you can you can still do all together um, when you're when you're below that sort of 100 person threshold. And again, like I, I think I said that at the start, but embrace your identity. You know the you don't have to be a triple A, and that's that's okay. You don't. Uh, that's not the natural outcome for everyone within this industry, and it's okay to to, to acknowledge that and embrace that and, and make that part of of who you are. Um, you know, obviously tell your staff that you know they don't don't lead them on and make them think that you're something that you're not. But the uh, there's plenty of opportunity in this industry uh, at, at every level. You don't have to be at the top. Um, you don't have to be at the bottom. There's 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 actually one of those few places where there's opportunities at, at every scale, um, particularly more so as the number of players just grows um you know year on year one of the the, the highest growing demographics in gaming is is, is uh, people age over the over the age of 50. so you know there's just uh don't be afraid to look in places and and, and do things that are a bit different to what everyone else is doing and make that a core part of, of your dna and, and who you are and uh, another benefit of being in this in this sweet spot is that uh you can still talk to everyone in your studio on, on, a, on a given day uh, that they can all sort of have a have a hand to, to play in, in the sort of opportunities that you that you chase uh, and and the strategy and direction of, of your studio so like allow it don't don't just restrict yourself to hearing from the people at the top you want to be as smart as everyone in the studio not just those people who are who are in uh, you know quote unquote leadership positions um, everyone can be a leader um, within an organization of that scale um, so embrace that and, and and make that a part of who you are and and the last thing, uh, which is a bit of a caveat as well, is um, you know, be nimble and be experimental. Uh, as a mid-sized studio, you almost have to be. This is it needs to be part of your DNA. It needs to be baked into what you do because the market will shift, the opportunities will change, and you need to be able to adjust and adapt to this to the new normal at at every stage. Um, you know, you, you're probably not big enough to be a trendsetter, um, and uh, you're you're probably uh, not small enough to be able to. To rely on your on your on your main hustle, uh, so you need to uh, make sure that you're always uh, adapting and changing and responding to to the market. Um, it means you can double down on opportunities that other people can't because you can move very very quickly, um, but you also can react quickly and uh, adjust strategy when things don't pan out, and that's uh, that's just as important. And uh, so this is actually the last strategy. Uh, I, I probably should put this at the top. But uh, if you can't beat them, join them, right? If, if it's a lot to run a business and to, to try and, and create a, you know, a studio within this space. And there's a lot to be said by letting someone else worry about all the stuff, the strategy, the, the, the finances, the, the payroll, et cetera. Um, and that's, this is great, right? There, we, there will be more acquisitions in this space. I think we're just seeing the start of it now, the start of a trend. And that's exciting. I, I think that's, that, again, shows a healthy ecosystem at play. And you know everyone's journey is going to be different here. They can't. No, I, I don't think for a minute that everyone's going to go on the same path that Mighty Kingdom went on. But that you know the same thing on the other side. Not everyone can be a team cherry, and so there's a there's a lot of opportunity in between. And and we need to let everyone find their own path and find their own strategy. And I suspect um, you know I've, I've ran through a few options here, but we'll we'll probably find that you know your path will be a combination of of a few of those things. I suspect, and and we'll see a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of new things um, pop up over the next few years.
Um, but yeah, ultimately our goal should be to create more successful exits for businesses. We should be encouraging more acquisitions. We should be looking at ways of taking, um, you know, those people who've invested in our industry for a long period of time. Uh, and when they do have those successful exits, let's keep them around and, and let's help them become the investors that fuel the next generation uh, of, um, of companies. Uh, but yes, uh, I'll touch very quickly here on a couple of what I see as the, the top two uh, challenges in any growth industry. And if you talk to any tech business in, in Sydney, they're probably uh, shaking their fist at Canva, who uh, I believe hired, over, you know, hired around a thousand engineers in the last year. So um, when an industry is experiencing growth, it makes it harder for everyone else to, to, to exist in there. So the, the two questions that pop up the most are, where do I find people and how do I keep them? And the, when it comes to, to finding people, like I said uh, earlier on, we're a bit of an anomaly. There should be a lot more people working in this industry given our, our population size. So I, I firmly believe that the talent is there if you look for it. And you know, I spoke recently on on, um, uh, on practical diversity for NZGDC. So I definitely encourage people to look at that. It talks a lot about hiring and, and how to adjust your strategy to, to find talent that other people are overlooking. But there are definitely more people looking to get jobs in this industry than there are people currently in the industry. And if you think about the explosive growth that we've seen in visual effects over the last uh, little while, there are heaps of people in adjacent industries who have the skill set that could map really well to what we do. Um, they just need a little bit of training to get across the line. Um, you know, a, a lot of them are probably screaming for a, a good nine to five job that uh, isn't, uh, you know, 60, 80, 100 hours a week like they, they can do in, in VFX. So. Like I say, the talent's out there. There should be ten thousand more people in this industry. So they're out there somewhere, even if uh, even if they're not aware uh, that we're coming for them just yet. And uh, just a note, a couple of notes on retention. One is um, that it's not always about money. Like it, this seems to be what employees, employers, sorry, think is the number one reason. But it's often when we conduct exit interviews, is not the, the the top reason that people go. Um, it's also why I don't necessarily believe in counter offers. I think if someone's made the, the, the mental decision, the mental leap to leave your organization, convincing them to say by just paying them more money, just I, I feel is just delaying the inevitable. Um, but you know, what you, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be reviewing salaries. In fact, you should be doing that regularly. You should be doing it all the time, making sure that you are paying people uh, according to the value that they create for your organization. And you want to be constantly evaluating that and, and, and checking that because you don't want to wait for someone else to set that value. You want to be doing it yourself um, and making sure uh, that you are rewarding people for for putting in. Um, yes, um, that's not to say that it's never about money. Right? There's a, there's a there's a line here below which uh, you know people can't go. So you just got to be um, making sure that you're doing the right thing by by the people in your organization, um, paying them an adequate amount. And and sometimes as as you're starting up. Um, you can reward them in other ways as well. There's there's plenty of, um, of benefits that you can get from having a progressive policies around uh, you know, a flexible work environment, et cetera, that can make your workplace attractive to people. That's more than just the money. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed that comes up quite a bit is that if people feel that they can't move forward with your organization, then they'll move out of your organization. Uh, always when you're looking to hire for a role, look look within before you look without. Look to promote people who are who are almost there, um, and provide them with the support and the and the training to 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 get all the way there. Uh, you know, I often find that when when people come to me with a with a hiring you know, position they want to hire for, when you break apart the requirements of the role, you can find that you often have a lot of that talent within the studio already, and so it's just a matter of uh, you know un unlocking the, the the you know giving them the opportunity to to take that step forward, and uh, addressing those small, you know, the areas where there may be a gap or, or, or an area that they need to improve on, giving them good mentoring, giving them good training. So as much as you can invest in training, I know that's easy to say, uh, more easy to say than it is to do. But one way to that you could achieve the same result is to make time within people's schedule to experiment with new ideas and new technologies. Uh, even if it's just a day, a fortnight, it can be enough to you know, unlock some, some new cool, crazy things, some new experiments that could become some great products that can then um, you know, and, and lead to some fantastic success. So definitely one to, to always um, push for. And But finally, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if if it's if people want to go, uh, you should let them go. If you love something, set it free, as, as they say. 
if you've done your job right, you've, you've found some really talented people, um, some really smart people, you've trained them well and you've given them that start in the, in, in the industry or, or given them an opportunity to, to demonstrate their talents. And other people will see that, other companies will see that and, and they'll look to, to hire those people and, and, and bring that stuff inside. For me, that's a, uh, that's a testament to the, to the hard work that we've done at Mighty Kingdom to, to create some fantastic um, talented people. And uh, make sure you do, when people do leave, that you conduct exit interviews so you can actually find those areas where you need to improve and find those things that people maybe felt a bit reluctant to say when they're in the studio, but when they've got one foot out the door, suddenly they can be a bit more, uh, a bit more free in their, in their criticisms. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to say goodbye. I, I hate doing exit interviews. That's why I get other, other people to do them for me. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the price we pay for being part of an industry that is growing and, and has created all this opportunity. We're going to have that occur more and more and we need to get used to it and, and, um, and, and recognize it for what it is. It's a healthy way for the great ideas and, and, the, and the great policies within, our, within companies to, to filter around uh, and to move around. My, my goal sometimes when people leave Mighty Kingdom is to take, you know, the, the, uh, take all the, the, the approach and the, the, the way that we like to, to treat people through their work-life balance you know, take all those policies with them to the places that they go to and, and demand something more. And, and, and hopefully the whole industry can move forward as a result that uh, everyone gets to benefit um, from the best ideas. Um, and that, that goes both ways. So on the home stretch here, um, you know, looking forward, for me, what does what does the future hold? What do I see uh, when I look ahead? And really, when I was putting this together and reviewing uh, my my slides from presentations past, the future is already here. The, the, all the things that I thought were going to happen over the next five and 10 years have actually already happened or they're in the process of happening. So I guess my only real prediction about what the, the next few years are going to bring is uh, I think we're about to see a major expansion of our industry. I've, I've touched it many times about the number of people that should be working in this industry. Uh, and, you know, we need to, to get ready for some, uh, some explosive growth. Uh, but that you know that doesn't mean that everything's tickety boo. There's still places that we need to improve on, and and so I still think that we, there, there's there's a lot more work to do here. There's plenty of things um, that we should be focused on as as the industry moves into this new phase. Uh, and the first one is that just to acknowledge that this pandemic is not over, and there are going to be more challenges, particularly as we try and open up. Um, you know to Make sure that our staff are supported and, and, and are safe. Um, not everyone is able to get vaccinated. Um, we have people who are immunocompromised in our industry that we need to be, and we need to ensure are, are, have a, are able to contribute and, and be part of this industry. And you know that we're still a long way from borders opening up. So we we, we are almost stuck with the talent that we have within with, within our within our borders. Um, and we need to focus on how we um, we upskill and train and, and, and fill those gaps that there are in, in the skill sets now uh, within Australia. And, you know, we want to make sure that those gains around uh, flexible work time and flexible work um, location, that we, that we bed those in, right? That we don't lose those as we, as we move back to a, a more, uh, you know, a post-pandemic normal, whatever, whatever that looks going to look like, um, that we don't take a step back in terms of the, the support and the policies that we've put in place to help people um, navigate through. You know, another thing, when I look across our industry, is we're still very stubbornly male. I looked at the latest IGEA report, and if anything, it looks like we've gotten more male over the last uh, period of time. And uh, it, you know, when we when we look at how many people should be work working in this industry, those, those ten thousand jobs, um, you know, they, they can't all be dudes, right? We've, we I, I, I have to believe that as the industry grows, that we will see those demographic shifts, and I will encourage everyone to review your hiring practices. Um, it's going to become really, really uh, competitive in, in the hiring space. And you're going to have to uh, open your eyes to the, op the opportunities and the possibilities of hiring people who may not look like your traditional game devs. Um, and you're going to have to uh, adjust your practices within your business to be able to support those individuals when they when they come in. And, and uh, again, I, I spoke about this just uh, recently at NZGDC, encourage everyone to, to check that out. But uh, look, that's something that we do need to keep an eye on and ensure that those that it's trending in the right way um, as we as we look forward. And yeah, I touched I touched on this earlier as well. There are there's increasing number of funding options available around to support businesses uh, in this space in, in, in Australia, but uh, it's a little bit haphazard and it's inconsistent across the states. And um, there's been a real focus on a I guess a top down approach in the last little while, and and that's fantastic. It's brought in some some big businesses that are going to create some some great 
opportunities within our, our industry. But at the same time, we need a bottom-up support as well. We need coordinated whole of life approach that supports a business from from starting up all the way through to scale up and beyond and and that means you know uh, funding for uh, adequate funding and appropriate funding for every life stage uh, we, we've seen it work elsewhere we've seen it work overseas it's about having that here and 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 building those bridges between the different funding that are available and, and helping businesses realize what is available and again i know igea are having a a, a lot of focus on in this area and they put a lot of work into it and this is an area where I think we can all advocate to our, our state governments and to the federal um, MPs as well about uh, it's not just about the big end of town. Um, it, you've got to make sure that we're getting people who will graduate from being at the small end to the big end of town and that everyone is, is, is taken on this journey. And that can help with this next one, which is we, we really do need more investment. There's, there's more investment coming in. I mean, obviously, we, we saw the big numbers at the top there, but that's all external. That's all coming from overseas or a large chunk of it is. I'd love to see more investment locally. I'd like to see seed funding and startup funding for businesses here. Uh, it's it's still not where it should be. We don't have that sophistication here uh, in the market that I'd, that I'd like to see. And my, my hope is that there's the a huge amount of capital that's just flowed in um, will return back into the industry in the form of, of investment that we will start to see these uh, these people who have had some um, fantastic transactions uh, and, and, and acquisitions will turn around and, and give that back and, and invest in that next wave of, uh, of business. Because we, we ultimately, we just need more success, right? Success breeds success. The more we have, the more positively impact everyone. Um, it it uh, helps us build confidence with the investment community, with the, with government. Um, the larger we get, the easier it is to talk to the, the, the federal government about, about uh, support and continued support, you know, making sure that we have um, uh, the support that we already have in play exists and, and continues for a long time. And, you know, there's, again, I've, I've spoken many times about how this is an industry where one person's success does not beget, uh, you know, does not uh, impact someone else's success. In fact, there's, there's more than enough for everyone. And, and the more success we have, the more that we build out uh, that full ecosystem, right? And, and this is me revisiting a, a slide from presentations uh, uh, gone past. and. Uh, you know, when, when we think about the the industry, we need to um, think about it as a, as an ecosystem of businesses of all scale. We, the way we survive the future, how we all survive the future, and, and not just any one business, but how everyone survives the, uh, survives the future, is by by building an ecosystem that supports the smallest and the largest studios that supports it at, at every scale. That uh, you know, an ecosystem that invests back in on itself, that builds that virtuous cycle of success leading to, to further success that um, you know those who have who've had wins then invest in the next uh, phase and help find those next winners and those next uh, uh, the next success stories uh, you know we an ecosystem that's supported by both state and federal governments in a coordinated fashion uh, that supports the whole of life cycle all businesses at all scale and an ecosystem that is a, a safe and welcoming space for everyone for all of us for for people of all different um uh, shapes and sizes and and, and backgrounds uh, it can't just be uh, a, a homogenous culture it needs to be one that's um, that supports us all and you know despite these challenges and, and the work that we need to do I, I i look around and i think this is as close as i've ever seen us get to this to this goal uh, and i feel that uh, the future for us is, is, is very bright and uh, yeah i guess that's uh that's where i start that's where i say thank you and We'll now pass over to any questions. Um, and I guess we're going from recorded field to real-time field. So talk to you soon.